course, and also thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Always enjoy these kinds of days where we actually get out into the field, we look at some things, and then we come back and talk about them a little bit more. Um, so I've been asked to talk about soil ecology and soil ecosystems. So I'm going to give you what I call the sort of soil ecologist's view of the world. Um, and if there are any questions, ask them now, or my contact details are up there as well. So soil is an ecosystem. All right, big question, what is soil? You guys have spent the day out in the field. What is soil? Yep. What's it made up of? No? No one knows what soil is. Okay. What's soil made up of? Minerals. Minerals. Yep. What else is in there? Organic matter. Organic matter. Yep. What happens if it rains? Water. Yep. If it doesn't rain, gas, right? The point that I'm trying to get at is soil is, and I usually put in the title of this one, soil is arguably the most complex material on earth, but I'm going to go with it is for this audience because it's such an incredibly complicated material. In that one material, it contains the solid phase. You've got the solid soil particles. It contains the liquid phase. You've got the water and the soil solution. It contains the gas phase as well. So in that one material, there's a lot of complexity. And all of that complexity really creates an interesting environment for organisms to live. Now, I'm not going to talk about tennis, to be honest, I'm not that interested in tennis, but it makes my point nicely. If you think about the solid phase, the soil particles, sand grains about two millimetres for coarse sand, clay particles less than two microns, right? There's a huge amount of variation in the size of those particles. So if you were to take one gram of coarse sand and work out the surface area of all of those particles, it would be about 10 square centimetres of surface area, about, about that much surface area in a coarse sand, one gram of coarse sand. If you were to take one gram of very fine clay, hence the clay tennis court, you would have the equivalent surface area of two tennis courts. Right? So that's just the physical particles themselves. So there's this huge amount of variability in the nature of those materials. Okay. I've got a pie chart as well, just like Mark has. Um, so this is a very average set of values for what a soil might be made up of. So it's about 43% mineral content. There's a bunch of water and air that makes about half of that, that material. And there's some organic matter. We've seen values down at 0.3 today. We've seen other soils where they're much higher. The point is that about half of the space in the soil is actually empty space. Right? So when you stand on this fairly solid material, about half of it's actually empty spaces between those particles. And of course, as the size of the particles changes, the size of the spaces between them changes as well. So really, half of the soil is actually nothing, right? It's gas or empty spaces. And of course, soil is the most complex material on Earth. There's huge amounts of heterogeneity if we look at soil profiles, and we saw some, some very nice ones today, and we can look at this from above as well. This is just an aerial shot. Um, from Google Earth and it's showing the heterogeneity that this farm is trying to deal with in managing their particular soils there. They're very different soils over quite small scales. So they're variable in the nature of the materials, they're variable as you go down in depth and they're variable as you move around in space as well. So it's this really, really complicated material, which is why I think I can get away with this soil, the most complex material on Earth. So when I think about soil as a microbial ecologist, thinking about the living organisms in the soil, I see a lot of empty space, right? And that's places for organisms to exist, to move around in. And so this, is a, this image is a, a three-dimensional, um, it's an X-ray CT scan. It's like when you go to the hospital and get a CT scan. The same thing's been done here with soil. And what this image is showing is the solid material, but then all the empty spaces in between them all these little nooks and crannies. And soils really comprise a complex network of tunnels that are of massively different sizes, right? So it's this big complicated network of tunnels and it can change in a moment, right? If you're an organism trying to live in that environment, it's dry, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, then suddenly it rains and you've been flooded. It can change incredibly quickly. If you're a sandy soil, that water passes by really quickly. If you're a clay soil, it can stick around for a long period of time. So it's a really complicated environment to live in as well because it keeps changing all the time. And a colleague described it to me like this, that if you're the size of an ant, if you want a drink of water, you actually go pick up a ball of water, right? You can hold it as a ball because of the surface tension and you can drink from that. But if you're a smaller organism and you're in a smaller soil pore, when the water comes along, you sort of get stuck against the walls, right? You get trapped in the water because the water wants to draw you in. 
And so the physics of water when you get down to these very small scales is really, really complicated and interesting, which is why soil physicists always have a bit of a headache because they're doing all this math, right? Trying to work out how do you describe this stuff? This is why I'm a biologist. I don't have to deal with that side of it. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Um, the point that I'm trying to get to is that soil contains a complex suite of ecological niches. Right, so with all this variability and complexity in the soil, that creates lots of different problems and challenges in the environment and lots of different organisms and lots of different diversity have found ways to solve the problem of life in dealing with that complexity. So that's why I, I find it a really interesting material as, as a scientist. Okay, so some soil ecology fun facts. These are really great things to bring out at dinner parties, I'm sure. Um, not that I go to many dinner parties, but anyway, if I did, I'm sure I would bring these ones out. So one gram of soil contains billions of bacterial cells, somewhere on the order of 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 11 cells. Right, if I was to take a handful of soil, there will be more bacterial cells in that handful of soil than there have ever been humans on the planet. Not the current human population, but ever. That just blows my mind, right? Because when I look out there and I see like a small lawn, imagine how many organisms are down there. That's, that's just a huge amount of diversity. Um, many tens of meters of um, fungal hyphae, many centimeters of roots as well in that one gram of soil. This image is hideous. Um, it reminds me of the curtains I had in my bedroom when I was a kid in the late 70s, early 1980s. But what it is is a graph. People usually laugh at that one. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Students laugh at that one. Okay, so what it is is a graphical representation of the microbial diversity. So each of those different little colored bars shows a different um, strain of bacteria, all within a gram of soil. So there's a huge amount of microbial diversity in there. Hopefully I'm not stealing Tom's thunder here. No, good, okay, I'll show this figure. Too late if I was. Um, this is from one of our vineyard soils and in the top 15 centimetres of soil we found a tonne of earthworms per hectare, right? So if you were to express that in dry sheep equivalent, it's about 20 DSE. So when you look out across that field and there's 20 sheep per hectare, there's the equivalent biomass of earthworms in the top 15 centimetres, right? And the soil goes much deeper than that, so it's a huge amount of life in the soil. It's a jungle down there, right? It's, it's a really complicated place. So why, why does this matter? So the soil biota are doing work. They're doing work for us. They're cycling nutrients, they're storing carbon, they're cycling it as, as Mark just described and as, as we've seen today as well. And so we often talk about ecosystem services, which are the many and varied benefits to humans. So it's a very human-centric definition. The many and varied benefits to humans provided by the natural environment from healthy ecosystems. So it's the work that those organisms are doing in the soil for us. That's what ecosystem services are. And so they include things like carbon cycling and nutrient cycling cycling, they um, purify the air and the water that we drink and breathe, uh, they um, can be beneficial insects, they can be predators of, of pests, um, they can also support above ground biodiversity. When you have more below ground biodiversity, you have more above ground biodiversity. So soils and the life in them really underpin a lot of ecosystem services that we rely on in, in so many different ways. And I, I could go on for days, and in fact I have gone on for days, about the types of ecosystem services that there are. Okay, so this all brings about a bit of a question of how do we study soil microbes, right? There's all this diversity down there. And as a microbial ecologist, I can stand up here and proudly say we can describe about 1% of it. We don't have a name for the other 99%. We don't know what most of those organisms are. So how do we possibly study these things? And so we, we've got a couple of little tricks. So one is we can look at the whole community. So there's been... Um, a lot of tools that have been developed. For example, you might have heard of next-gen sequencing and things like that. And what we can do is we can look at the fingerprint of the entire community. So we're not necessarily saying we know everybody's name and what they do, but we're looking at the entire community and the structure of that community. So it's like a list of the relative abundance of the different critters that are out there. So we call these omics approaches. We can also look at nutrient cycling and the activity of enzymes, and Mark talked about respiration as well. And the reason I put a picture up here of a medico is, well, if I go back a step, so when I went to university, they told us that nothing lived in the human gut because it was too acidic, right? Now you can't open like any sort of publication without reading about the human microbiome and the tremendous diversity of organisms that live within our gut. And in fact, this one blows my mind. As I stand here, I've got a certain number of human cells, but I actually have more microbial cells. So we are more microbial cell than we are human cell. 
That just blows my mind. We're mostly microbe in terms of cell number. But anyway, the point about the medicos is when they realize that all these organisms are living in humans and having an impact on their health, all these tools were suddenly developed to study them. And so we're taking these tools from medical sort of fields and applying them to soils to explore and understand that diversity. So the first time that I looked at microbial diversity in soils, we extracted about 12 different species. Now we pull out tens of thousands, right? Just over the course of my career, the tools have got so much better. So we can look at the whole community. Another approach is we can look at functional groups. And I, I was pleased to hear our vascular mycorrhizas mentioned this morning. That's what I did my PhD on some years ago. Um, they're a group, this sort of functional group approach is where we can say we know who they are and we know what they do. Right? So they're a bit like a lab rat. You know who they are and you know what they do. We know what they look like. We know how to add them to the soil. We know how to take them out of the soil. And we know what the services are that they provide. So we can look at the whole of the community or we can look at specific functional groups. So normally, at this point in the talk, I'd put this slide up and I'd start to talk about undivine cover crops, but Tom is speaking next, so I'm not going to go into that. And I thought I'd talk about a different kind of system, but I think there's some, some interesting parallels to some of the stuff we're talking about today. So I mentioned our vascular mycorrhizas. So this is not a carrot, okay? Just to be clear, this is meant to be a stylized diagram of a root system. So the way that plants take up nutrients is they directly absorb them across the epidermis, right? So we've got a mineral nutrient that's going into the plant root. But about 80 to 90% of terrestrial plant species form symbiotic or beneficial associations with what we call mycorrhizal fungi. So these are beneficial fungi that live in the soil and they provide an ecosystem service. So we've got the spore of the fungus out here in the soil and the hyphae grow into the roots. They colonize the internal structures of the root cells. And then they grow out into the soil, 10, 20, 30 centimeters beyond the rhizosphere. And they take up mineral nutrients and they translocate them along their hyphae and they deliver them to the plant. Okay, so they're out there foraging for nutrients, taking them up and delivering to the plant. At the same time, the plant's photosynthesizing, it's capturing carbon, and it delivers about 20% of that carbon back to the fungus, right? And it does that at the expense of roots. And the reason it does that is because the fungus is doing a more efficient job at taking up those nutrients and delivering them to the plant. So the plant can afford to allocate some of its carbon to the fungus rather than root production. So there's a very fine balance that's going on there. Okay, so that's what the, the association is. It's a functional group. We know who they are, they know what they do. So this was some work that we did in California a bunch of years ago, um, where we've got two varieties of tomato. So these are fresh market tomatoes. They're, it's an organic farming system. One of them's able to form mycorrhizas, the beneficial association. The other one's a mutant that can't, right? So what we can do is we can grow these two plants side by side in the field, one forms the beneficial association, the other one doesn't. So that's a really useful tool for working out what it is these fungi do, what their ecosystem services are. So we grew them in the field side by side, we irrigated them and then about halfway through we switched off the water, we reduced the water to about 50%. So we had some well watered plants and some deficit irrigation plants to look at drought stress. And we found some really interesting responses in terms of the crop yield. And we wanted to ask really basic questions. Are changes in yield driven by changes in nutrient uptake and water relations or photosynthesis when the plants were mycorrhizal or not? So really it was like, what, what are the fungi doing for the plant? So to, to cut a very long and complicated story short, basically what we found is if we look at the shoot biomass, okay, so we've got the well-watered plants. So these two plants are well-watered and these are under the droughted conditions. And we've got our mycorrhizal plants here and here and here and here. All right, so, you know, you came all the way out here to learn that if you give plants water, they grow better. There you go. That's one take home message for today. And the mycorrhizas didn't do anything. But what was really interesting was when we looked at the fruit yield. So the fruit biomass was about 25% higher in the mycorrhizal plants than the non-mycorrhizal plants. Right, that's money, that's more yield that we're seeing. And what I find really interesting in this context is under the droughted conditions, the mycorrhizal plant did as well, if not slightly better than the non-mycorrhizal plant under the well-watered conditions. Right, so you're getting a real benefit from having that association. And so this caused a lot of interest around the droughts and things that were going on in, in California at the time. And what it came down to was the fruit weren't bigger they were more abundant. So if you count the number of flowers, there were more flowers in the mycorrhizal plants compared to not. 
So anyway, that's just one, one example. Um, so yeah, a bit of a summary diagram up there. What we found was the mycorrhizal plants had 25% higher yield. Uh, the stomatal conductance was 8% higher. So what we think was going on here was higher transpiration and cooler canopies. Right, so the plants are adjusting their water relations and the um, carbon assimilation was higher in the mycorrhizal plant and we think that the, there was a stronger sink for that carbon because there were more fruit. Okay, and this is all because of a change in the soil microbes. Okay, so often when I talk to, to farmers, the, the question I get is how do I support the life in my soil? And basically microbes want the same things as us, right? They want food, we heard about the carbon from Mark. They want some water as well. Water's quite useful if you're trying to remain alive. Um, they want some shelter. They don't like to go camping, I don't believe, but they like some <laughs> shelter. That was the best that I could find. Um, and they also want someone to look after them. They want someone to take care of them and think about how they're managing the soil. And so I guess the, the take home message that I, I always try to give in these kinds of things is, don't forget about the life underfoot. When you're making a management decision about what's going on above ground, also just have a little think about what the impacts might be below ground. Okay, because those two things are really intimately connected. All right, I reckon that's me. So I'm um, yeah, happy to take any questions or save them for later.